It was the next night and we went out and we were doing spot after spot. We went to the gas station and um, me and Zest like had just an awkward encounter with a local guy in the gas station. He was just like staring us out and just mm-hmm. being real intense. And then we went back and hopped in the car and I noticed the guy was like on the forecourt just idling, waiting for us to pull out. And then we pulled out and he pulled out right behind us. Then we turned left and he turned left and we turned right and he turned right. And then just suddenly the entire back windscreen of the car shattered. Mm-hmm. Revoke starts driving defensively. He's like swerving and he's like, is he shooting? Is he shooting at us? And like, we're all down near Zeph's and Olga in the back seat, and we're like completely covered in shattered glass. And we're swerving all over the road like maniacs. And I'm like trying to look back through like the back windscreen to see if this guy is shooting at us or chasing us. And uh, he just very casually drives into, I guess, his driveway. What? And I'm like, killer, killer, KillerKellerOfficial.com You need the Kellervision app. 24-7 mini documentaries, podcasts, live shows, DJ live streams, top fives, subscription packages, plus products for all your podcasts and street culture sports. Download it from the App Store for free today. Instagram UK Frontline. Yo, Nolan Poland Records for underground classics. NolanPolandRecords.com Box created. Killer Keller. And we need to talk about world music and street culture. Killer Keller Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, Killer Keller Podcast, live and direct, central London, or as central as you need to be. You don't need to be anywhere else, I told you, at least 390 times. Um, big shout to all the regulars, big shout to Strain Station, big shout to Graffiti Kings, you, and of course, big shout out to NoPolandRecords.com. Um, it's it's a fine it's a fine graffiti podcast week and uh, we're going transatlantic um, we're going across the other side eight hours away to be precise from where we're standing and sitting right now wherever you're doing um, this guy when I say he's an international traveller that goes without saying part of the MSK camp New Zealand, the first and foremost California resider, now currently in Portland, one of the style definers, ask you MSK inside the place. How are we, sir? I'm good. What an intro. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, no expense spared on this one, my friend. <laughs> How's it looking over there? How are you doing over there? It's good, man. Yeah, Portland's been a bit of a, an interesting transition, but um, I like it here. I kind of like the the weather here. It's kind of familiar. It feels like Auckland. So mm-hmm. yeah. Although although we just had this crazy heat wave and it was like, you know, 40, 43 degrees every single day yeah. for like the first two and a half months I was here. So yeah, yeah, but it's cool. Oh, so it gave you a real false account of what the weather's actually going to be like. Now it's all of a sudden it's like okay, no, 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 now now we're back to Portland time. It's, it's, yeah. this, this is this is the weather. This is the real weather. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like people make a big deal about it when you talk to them. They're all like, oh, yeah, you know, get ready for the rain. It rains for seven months a year. And it's like, oh, all right. I've been waiting this whole time. We've had wildfires and, and you know, scorching heat. And then just like this, boom, change of the season and it's raining. Dude, I mean, that this this is um, this resonates across most of that West Coast as you get further up towards mm-hmm. Seattle into Vancouver and, and mm-hmm. the like. If you're not watching and you're listening... Ask you in the background of his, um, I guess his studio apartment, his office, wherever wherever he is at the moment. There's a beautiful uh, backdrop of Portland. Um, at least I'm hoping it is, and it isn't a glorified, um, <laughs> a glorified <laughs> painting. But but it looks it looks it looks the business. It's it's interesting, man. It's really a very eclectic city. It has everything. Like it's it's a bit grimier than people realize too. But it's green. It's super green. Like. Mm. This part of the Northwest, I think, because of that rain, you know, it's really lush. And that was the first thing I felt like when we came here for, on a house hunting trip. We moved out here because my my wife got a job here and um, they relocated us and we got to come out on a house hunting trip. Um, and the first impression just driving, um, you know, on the freeway, like into the city from the airport. And it was just like all of the freeway was just lined with green. But it's also covered in graffiti. Like mm-hmm. it's, it's a cool place. It kind of has everything that I want. Um, it's a good place for eating, a good place for drinking. I have like three breweries on my street, which is a little dangerous, but you know, 
We do breweries, you know, not being yeah. good enough to have like pubs. No, you got breweries. Yeah, Ooh. like they are. They're like full on breweries. Like they're making the beer right there. You're getting it fresh. Yeah. And it's, uh, yeah, it's nice. I like yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Talk to you about the weather a little bit more in regards to graffiti. But like you just said, mm. that there's there's a lot of graft that's uh, um, orbiting around Portland. There's a lot. And I think that there's a lot of people that are in these kind of northwest cities that travel between, you know, like, so I think like people come from Seattle down and vice mm. versa. They, they, they kind of seem like they're very connected scenes because there's a lot of names that I see that are like up in, in both cities. Um, it's oh, like, so it's just, so it's interconnected like that. So there is there are from one all city to another. They they they're migrating. It certainly feels that way. Like it's from a, a somewhat kind of outside perspective, um, but I, I feel like you know, it, especially in the area where I live, I'm I'm just in like what they call the kind of central east side, so on the the southeastern side of the river, right? Um, and it's it's a bit industrial. It reminds me a bit of like. I don't know what I compare it to. Maybe if I was talking in New York terms, it's a bit like like Bushwick or uh, something. Okay, like it, just as far as like aesthetically the way it looks and uh, a lot of like converted warehouse spaces and stuff and an area that maybe I, I get the impression like maybe ten years ago it wasn't as kind of trendy as it is now. You know, it's, God, yeah, yeah you, you know what it is. Like London yeah. has plenty of that too. You know, yeah. but um, there's a lot of graffiti here. There's a freight line that runs like through like three blocks from my house so i hear that rolling through and they have to honk their horn at every intersection so the blocks are only about two buildings wide so they're honking their horn like about 20 times as they go past my house like, yo yo ten, only, ten a graffiti like, writer, only a graffiti yeah. writer would say that's a good thing <laughs> I, it, it's real good until you have like a one-year-old baby you know then you're super <laughs> super conscious about like them sleeping at all costs you know but but yeah. to be honest um she can sleep through anything um and and i find it soothing i, I grew up next to a train line in, in new zealand so you know in auckland so um i kind of i like it yeah my, yeah. my wife not not so much yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I, I can i can i can imagine um okay well let, let's jump into it because i, I do obviously mm-hmm. want to get into some more portland business but there's also la there's new york there's mm-hmm. there's there's new zealand and these are the only ones that i know about so let's mm-hmm. go from the start okay how 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 did it all begin like mm-hmm. you're in new zealand let's start there all right um so I, I come from originally like a small city called Palmerston North, um, which is a little bit closer to the capital, Wellington. But um, And my parents were really young. Like my mum was still in high school when she had me. Um, and her and my father were like really super into punk like music mm-hmm. and really in that kind of early scene down there in Palmerston North. And they ended up, um, they split up when I was 14 months. But we all anyway ended up living in the city, Auckland, which is like, the largest city in New Zealand is, is it's got like roughly the about half the country's population pretty much lived there. Um, so, you know, it's a pretty sizable city, like even by American standards, you know, it's not as big as like, you know, like, I mean, it's almost the same size landmass wise as, as Los Angeles County. Um, and a lot of people will compare it more to places in Northern California, like San Jose or something. It gets compared to Seattle a lot too, but it has a population of around, just over 2 million. Right. Um, and it's, it's a pretty bustling place. Like it's, it's pretty cool. The graffiti scene there kind of kicked off uh, kind of pretty similar time to where it kicked off everywhere outside of New York. And mm-hmm. it was mostly due to all the, the usual culprits, the usual media it was, you know, Star Wars played on TV as a Sunday night documentary. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, everyone they didn't know what they were getting themselves into. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and over, overnight there were people painting, and the most the most well known crew that featured in spray can art um, from my area actually is a crew called Smooth Crew or Smooth Incorporated, mm-hmm. and they were pretty advanced. Like they were painting really good, like as early as sort of you know eighty three, eighty four. Mm-hmm. Um, so when we moved to Central Auckland, we moved to an area called Morningside, Kings and Rudd, sort of right on the cusp. But we're kind of the same area in a way um the morning said train line had a lot of their pieces and it was the first graffiti that i saw so um there wasn't immediately like when they had done the pieces like it was a little later like because we moved to that neighborhood actually in 87 so i'd already been living in grayland for a while came over right. to 
to Morningside, went to the local school, Mount Talbot Primary, and used to cut down the train line every day and see these pieces. And, and it definitely made a massive impression. And then, so that's our first wave. Then our second wave is, is more California, like more Southern California inspired wave of graffiti. Um, and that's mostly due to the kind of flow of, of our Polynesian populations, people moving from the Pacific Islands, living in the West Coast of the United States, living in Australia, coming to New Zealand. And that whole kind of like flow of that kind of Pacific diaspora is like being kind of key. Um, and a lot of it was because there was a lot of kids that were like from Mormon families. There's a lot of Polynesians mm-hmm. like Samoans and Tongans that are like Mormons. Gotcha. And, and so they go to California, they go to Utah, they go to Hawaii to to like do their missions or to like go to Mormon schools or to kind of tap into that community. But the kids are also like at that time, we're talking late 80s, early 90s, mm-hmm. doing things that young kids are into, you know, like and they're getting into graffiti and they're getting into gang culture and they're getting into the fashion and they're playing basketball and they're bringing all these things back, you know. Mm-hmm. So like the Mormon kids were always the first to have, you know, turntables, the first to have like nice sneakers, to have starter jackets, to have like, NWA on cassette, you know, like it was just, you know. And not the dubbed and, version either, the original too. Yeah, like the, these kind of kids end up being the kind of culture bears. So there's a guy called um, Finer. He was from Mangani in South Auckland, and he he grew up for a time in Los Angeles, and uh, he brought back a big pile of photographs of, like, all the cholo kind of graffiti, gang graffiti, oh, wow. but all, all, also a lot of late 80s, you know, like um, – graffiti graffiti crews from LA like photos of their tags he was more into the tags and the pieces and um everybody kind of lifted from from that and we developed this kind of style of tagging that's referred to as straights isn't that so crazy they, so what's it called straights are like kind of like our kind of it's quite this menacing kind of straight and like yeah. it's a straight but they're usually leaning to the right well in a kind of, kind of a, a philly kind of philly kind of way it's 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 funny because Americans often compare us to Philly because not that the tags look like Philly wickets or anything, but mm. that it's just such a distinctive looking style of tagging mm. that's just completely like Auckland that um that it's pretty much the main thing people notice, you know. Yeah. And so that's that's the wave that me and my friends kind of are coming up as youngsters through that wave. But then there's another wave which is mostly like like maori you know who are indigenous new zealanders mm. artists that have grown up for a period of their teens in australia and cities like sydney and melbourne who are more into like painting on trains mm-hmm. um who who come back with that kind of knowledge and then wow. that's the next the next wave and so that's like uh mid mid 90s and then we're coming out of the straits era and then we're looking at it's a small handful of guys it's like literally five or six guys, you know, but they're really good. And um, and we're kind of the weird hybrid of those two eras, you know, which is – and we're part of a big wave. Like when I started painting, I mean, honestly, I felt like every kid my age was painting. Like there was just hundreds of kids. Really? Oh, yeah, God, like I love graffiti. that. Yeah. It was really cool. It was cool because our infrastructure was really like – basic like our rail infrastructure back then like we had like we just we only had trains like five uh six days a week and they ran from 6 a.m to 6 Mm p.m and then they just stopped so nighttime you might get the occasional freight and sundays there was absolutely no trains on the train line but there was like hundreds of kids cruising up and down all day with ladders and buckets of paint and spray cans and we all met each other like literally like the whole scene was just kind of connected face to face. It was sort of the internet was just emerging, you know, yeah. as a thing, but it was like, this was like our internet. <laughs> yeah. 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 For real. Yeah. Mm. I think mean, that's something. I, I love the cross pollination of it all. I love the fact that, you know, it was, it's, it's just, it's the way the settlements, people land on the settlements. And then before you mm. know it, they're, they're creating these new varieties, new new species of uh, 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 tagging and piecing yeah. and, and working within the environment as well. Mm-hmm. That's what I love about it too. I, I, I think that's the the beauty of like a culture like hip hop 
and you know, and then more broadly, things like graffiti, which are you know not limited to just hip hop, but are kind of part of it. Mm. Um, it's it's the ingenuity, and it's the the ability to make something out of nothing. 100%. You know, or, or or limited resources, and I, and I think that that's something, and it also goes back to the whole emphasis of someone like Martha Cooper's photographs of like kids at play, you know, because mm. like play, like you know, I have my daughter now, and everything she does all day when she's not fast asleep is just play focused. It's just mm. all about doing, and that's how you learn. You know, like it's mm-hmm. like you learn everything through play, you know, and it's, and it's super important. And kids that don't have any resources, don't have much, just get out into this environment. There's this rail infrastructure that's like decrepit and barely works, mm-hmm. you know, um, but it served a really vital purpose for a whole bunch of kids who were kind of lost and looking for something. It's interesting you say that. My mind does go a wander quite a bit on the whole making something out of nothing. And mm. the 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 serious play of it all. Do you know what oh, I mean? Yeah. Yes. This, is a, this isn't just like your average get your toys out your toy box play. This is like no. we're gonna have a serious <laughs> fucking play. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And yeah. and then it becomes that's when things really start to become serious, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know. I mean. I mean. I think obviously in in your line of things, you know, that's that's the ultimate of like what you do when you don't have expensive equipment, yeah. you know, is that you could make a beat literally with your mouth. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's just like that's and 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 it is serious because yeah, people yeah, yeah. go they they it's it's a lot of like this thing that young people do of like defining themselves through this kind of competition. Yeah. This kind of, you know, looking for for other people and and battling them, you know, like and then, yeah. you know, the, the but but the respect and camaraderie that comes through going through that with your peers, you know, it's, 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 it's a beautiful thing, you know, it has its negatives, you know, but there's a lot more beautiful, a lot more beauty to it. It's true, isn't it? Uh, you just alerted me to a ton of scenarios whereby for its time, I got the right, I, I got disgruntled. The Brits call it the hump. I, I had the yeah. hump about, <laughs> about <laughs> things that at the time, you know, if there's a battle going on and, Okay, there was no real winner, or maybe he won, or maybe uh, you know, whatever. Even I won. <laughs> but the mm. point being is that the animosity, that the sheer poison you have for someone at that particular yeah. time, it's only yeah. later, like six six years on or some shit, that you can actually chill and have a beer with them and say, "Hey, do you remember that?" Isn't you it do. so bizarre? It is, and and the funny thing is, like you know, we all kind of mellow with age, like we hope. You know, because yeah. I've seen people that were the worst of enemies, and you know they're all a bunch of like middle aged dads now at the pub <laughs> hanging out. You know, like yeah. and reminiscing about the old days. So it's kind of sweet, isn't it? It's like, yeah. <laughs> but you know, we had um, we had a lot of different influences, a lot of key people. Like I think you you uh, mentioned that you interviewed me, and he mm. played a really massive massive part. Like for the year that he lived, he lived with us in, in Auckland in ninety nine. Stop, wait, hold on, brakes. Mean PFB. Yes. Big up mean, my guy. So what, I he know. lived with you guys? Yeah, he was chefing for a year out there. And um, and we met him, like, well, we seen him up first, mm-hmm. you know, because he was doing, like, like chrome pieces on, on street corners and, like, some of the busiest locations. And we was like, what the? And he had this classic very strong old school kind of style, you know, yeah. and, and the greatest, probably one of the best throbs, like Hands period. Like, down, bro. Yeah. Oh yeah. Sick. Just got the greatest, greatest throb. And, um, he was, you know, I went to this, this gig, it was kind of an infamous night because it was like, I think it was like, I'm trying to remember what, what, what DJ it was, but it was, my friend used to organize the ITF battles. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And my friend DJ Severe and he, he, used to get me to lay out all the like party flyers and stuff. It's like, I was fresh out of high school and, and that was like my first gig, you know, like mm. making money. And, um, but I was underage cause they hadn't lowered the drinking age yet to 18. So I actually wasn't old enough to go to the, to these events. And I had kind of begged, begged him to let me come to this gig. Uh, I don't know who it might've been. It might've been like Vinrock or someone like that. that was, was oh, DJ. It was someone, someone awesome anyway heavy, heavy, yeah, yeah. And, 
Yeah, and he, he let me come in and he was like, you know, you better better promise me, you know, that you're going to be well behaved and not do anything. <laughs> and so I get in there and, like, I do have a marker in my bag, but I have no intention to use it, of course. Yeah. And uh, everybody's there. And then there's this real happy English guy and he's like popping and locking and rapping and playing pool. And he's just like, looks like the happiest like human being you've ever seen in your life. Sounds I'm like, I bet, I'm like, I bet that's me, you know? <laughs> so we all got talking to him and stuff. And then I don't know, at some point, like, I don't know if it was him that found out that I had a marker in my bag. I think my ex, ex girlfriend like had, had told him I did. And all these other people were like taking turns with this marker, and I was totally oblivious. I was up the front row of the gate, having a, a good time, and they were all trashing the shit out of the whole venue. And everybody was putting me up, like because it was my marker. Oh my god! So, so, so as a consequence, I ended up like my name was the most up name all through the venue, and both the men's and women's toilets were completely destroyed. <laughs> uh, of course, I was completely oblivious to this. I was just mm-hmm. having a good night. And um, then I left the, the gig and it was about two days later. Oh, one of DJ Severe's uh, boys, this guy, uh, DJ Bass, he, he was like, used to host the True School Hip Hop Show with him. And he like cornered me on Ponsomy Road. I, I didn't even know what was coming. And it's like, we lost our bond because of you. We had to pay like, you know, 1500 bucks, like to clean it all up and all oh, stuff. And I was like, Oh shit. shit. And they went to town. They went to town on me on the radio, blasting me and saying, you know, like, I mean, I spent, I spent like months, like basically tiptoeing around in the void. What? They put you on blast <laughs> on radio as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was pretty <sighs> crazy. Is that, but, is that, know. is that a drink six years later kind of conversation where everything's chilled out nowadays? You know, the funny thing is that DJ Severe, like probably not that long after that, he kind of became one of the main people to kind of like, like put me on and look after me, like in the industry, like, and because of that, I mean, because I've ever worked with, alongside or for him, like so many times, like through my life, like, you know, uh, I used to organize a, a graffiti festival at home. I started doing it in 2000 and mm. him and DJ Ali from Christchurch were doing the hip hop summit and they um, didn't really know where to start with the graffiti component of that. Mm. So they asked me to join forces with them and kind of merge my event into theirs. And cool. they gave me a budget to work with is how I, I got to bring so many good artists out to, out to New Zealand. Oh, that, was like, like, that was like a seminal moment, right? Where you've got a budget and you can bring whoever you want out there. It's huge because, you know, actually I did the first event by myself and I brought Lumet out Ugh. from from Germany. Ugh. And it was so wild because I, you know, like I just got on the internet more or less and he had a, a web page. It's still mm. the same. Like he's never updated his website since 1999, you know. <laughs> but I, I like wrote him and said, you know, do you, do you want to come to New Zealand? And he was like, yeah, I've been there three times already. It's like my favorite country in the world. Uh, just give me a ticket and give me a couch to sleep on and I'll be there. And I was like, whoa, and we brought him out. But I did that event. Like I didn't even know how to write a sponsorship proposal. You know, I didn't, hadn't even been to a graffiti jam. I just knew that there were these things that were happening in Europe. You know, mm. like I was just like, I know I'd seen like in like a, a back jumps magazine or something, photos from like the meeting of styles yeah, 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 something. Yeah. And, and I was just like, Oh, that's a cool idea. Like we should have one of those. You that's know? So right. I visualized in my head based on these photos, like what this jam would look like. Wow. Ask this kind of, um, this older guy that ran a gallery and he was sort of used to be like a dance party promoter and stuff back in the days. The only person I thought might know how to find the money. Mm-hmm. And he, he gave me a digital Rolodex when that was still a thing. Well, it, yeah. Like, right. And he's like, it looked like a calculator and he's like, you know, punch in, punch in the name of the brand that you could see on your flyer that you think would, would work as sponsors. And so, you know, I started off with all the, the Nikes and the, you know, I don't know, Red Bull and kind of all this stuff. All the higher tier ones first, of course. Yeah, started like, you know, hitting them up and cold calling these agents, you know, that because he had their, you know, the the appropriate contact for each of these brands. And then, um, yeah, none of them, none of them said yes. I I sort of wound up with like Dirty Dog sunglasses Mm -hmm. and like uh, some bootleg Red Bull called Red Eye 
that was like, <laughs> like gave, a, gave you gave wheels you instead the, of wings. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> kind of just gave you the fucking shakes. You know? <laughs> gave you the shakes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's that's how that's how I did it. You know, like um, we didn't even have like good paint in the country back then. Like it was still mm. just plastic coat. Like wow. it was just like I mean, I got a plastic coat to sp- sponsor the event, which was like so wild. You know? That's mad. Oh, how did Lumit and and Co feel about that for his time? You know, I think the thing with Lumit is he he's one of those people that uh, will adapt. Uh, yeah. no matter what the circumstances and and he you know he he'll use any paint and i did an event shortly after where i brought diane out as well mm. and he, he also he didn't complain about the paint he made it look like you know like he was using like monotop or something it's like but he was using plastic coat you know and it was yeah. it was it was a pretty wild experience man I, I i learned a lot i learned a lot from them yeah because i'm pretty sure that you know if 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 there are no um other brands, no one's got the mm. home field advantage here of having their hands on a, you know, some Montana or whatever belt, and then it's it kind of stands to reason that okay, well, let's create something with our in our means. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean it's it's interesting because I heard a story that Luma today goes to a lot of countries where they don't even have spray paint available, and he will paint with whatever the the accessible medium is. That's you know, and that's fantastic. But he's always been different. You know, mm. like he's just like a, diff- a different type of dude. You know, like he, he he's probably like a genius. He's like the Skrillex of graffiti, isn't he? He's just like <laughs> he's so he's so out of it, man. Like yeah. I, he told me, and I don't know if it's a hundred percent true, but it's probably true. He told me that he bought a horse the first time he came to New Zealand in like nineteen ninety one. Well, and he rode from the top of the South Island to the bottom of the South Island, like on horse, like horseback. Wow. Like he is that dude. Like on some... <laughs> I mean, it, I mean, listen, if you've ever been to New Zealand, this, this place is absolutely spellbindingly beautiful, isn't it? It's, you know, New Zealand is just, it's, it's breathtaking. You could just take a drive down in a car. And it's, you yeah. know, within the road that, that leads from, because, you know, it's quite sparse in places. You don't get a petrol mm-hmm. station for like fucking miles. Yeah. But as long as you've got petrol in the tank, it's, you, you're quite all right with that. The landscape well, you, is gorgeous. Well, you can see a lot of different climates in a, in a short space of time. So, right. And you, and, you know, there's parts of the country where you can see both coasts like easily within a couple of hours. You know, Crazy. I mean, in, in Auckland, where I'm from, it's a, a narrow, kind of isthmus so it's like it's got coasts on both sides so it's actually only 45 minutes between the two um that's mad so you're just surrounded by water that's why it rains so much that's you know that's why this is kind of familiar to me it's mm. like yeah but it's it's yeah it's interesting eh? and it's a dramatic looking place you know, the really low hanging atmosphere you know mm. like the clouds are always looking epic I mean, it sounds quite yeah. a romantic idea what's it what does it do for the creative mind you know like Let's let's get into the mind of, of ask you at like a time when you were very much uh, that you were a sponge and your receptors were on Luma had come in. You 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 were doing these major events and how was your style? How was your creative development at that time? I mean, I think I was pretty lost, like a lot of young people. Like I don't think I was one of those people with a really defined sense of style or necessarily a, a true individual style and yet. You know, I was, as you say, a sponge. Um, you know, I, I I treated every person I came in contact with, I, I treated them like a um, a teacher. Mm-hmm. You know, like I just, to me, in my mind at least, I, I sort of saw myself like that it was a humble position to take to like basically ask as many questions, observe and learn as many techniques and ideas and philosophies from people as possible and try them out you know, and to see what works. And, and, you know, you kind of work out what's kind of good, what's a good fit for you and what's sort of expedient, you know, like unnecessary, you know. Mm -hmm. So, like, for me, like, for example, I I just, like, you know, there was something of the work ethic of those German guys that that's probably what what got me the most, you know. Like, they Mm -hmm. they just had, like, a a different type of work ethic, you know. Yeah. Um, Sometimes they kind of took the fun out of it a little bit, you know, <laughs> like they were so, so serious, but so German, yeah. you know, 
Um, <laughs> yeah, they're, 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 they're the finishing project products spoke volumes. To, from what I remember, it was yeah. like you say, it it it, it 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 lost the fun pretty quickly. Yeah. But then what you gained, I mean, these guys were on the precipice of like brands that they yeah. were actually more or less introducing us to the brands and the caps and everything whilst doing these crazy. Do you remember? It was mad. Yeah, I mean, I think there was a lot of like technological development at that time because you kind of had the advent of like actual graffiti brands, mm. like people people that actually like you know were were really kind of tailoring the product to us, you know. Whereas like you know most of us had grown up using some real wayward tools mm. and shoplifting everything we used, you know, and then suddenly it, it was becoming an industry, and it was these guys that were they were testing the product, they were working with the manufacturers you know, to get the valve systems right, you know, mm. they were doing all of that, that work, you know, and, and all of that development was happening in Europe between like Spain and Germany, basically. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was a pretty interesting time. And then, you know, you could take that and then say you would have someone like me around, you know, mm-hmm. and from me, you would learn spontaneity and kind of fun and going mm-hmm. with the flow or just, you know, he's one of those people that would paint a really, really scary spot uh but he'd be smiling and cracking jokes and dancing while he did it you know and you're just like okay you know it's just it's just and everything just sort of mm-hmm. up his shoulders you know so you, you see a different outlook you see the total opposite mm-hmm. and then you know and then start to have more connection with the, the u.s guys as well like it was sort of between that there was a really big portion of time where i spent a lot of time with Cantu. Oh, in Germany nice. and yeah. Atom and Wow One Twenty Three and these guys, had, oh yeah, yeah, huge, huge impact on us, huge mm-hmm. impact on my whole crew, you know. Um, and yeah, they they kind of bridged the gap, kind of between I think like the aesthetic and and approach and attitude of American writers, you know, but mm-hmm. they they still had that kind of real methodical kind of German thing about them too. Atom and, has a Atom just has that so much funk, man. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. He's just, he's definitely got yeah. he's got a he's got a great style, you know, wow. and 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 he's a legend, you know, and, mm. and the hip hop scene he's he's somebody that's that's done a lot. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's like big time. they were the they were the first, you know, um like too strong like the first group to get a record deal in Germany that rap in German instead of in English. Mm-hmm. I, I think they become like early on the early songs they were rapping in English and they realized that it wasn't really working for them. This isn't working. Yeah. 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 Cause it, it, you know, it, it, it definitely is always going to sound weird, you know, like compared yeah. to like when you get to actually speak with the fluency of your, your own language and, you know. Yeah. I had, I've, I had um, Sammy Deluxe on from the mm. um, same uh, neck of the woods as Atom. These guys, yep. are, they're very tight as as, as, as uh, friends go. And um, it's actually unthinkable, the idea of, for where German hip-hop's become, uh, mm. gone, gone to become, it's, it's, it's unthinkable that they, because I'm a big German hip-hop fan, it's crazy to mm. think that they'd be denying the fact and having, you know, even half the idea that they were going to rap in English is kind of unthinkable now when you see the industry yeah, and shit, right? Absolutely. Yeah, because they've got they've got their own thing going on. Yeah. I mean, I think the era, like, probably, because I think we're much the same age. I think, like, the era that we were growing up, you know, it was so, and it's still, because hip-hop is such a, uh, in the beginning, such an American thing. Yeah. Such a, you know, it's 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 really native to, to New York City, you know, and, and so much of it. Mm. you know what it has um people grappling with their own unique approach to it mm. and and infusing their kind of their local kind of flavor like i remember when i first listened to uk hip hop you know it it probably like there was a cringe aspect i think that people didn't know how to deal with yet because it was like it was so english yeah it's true and and now when now you see the impact that that has where it's come in reverse, you know, impact on, 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 you know, the scenes out here in North America where people are like really fascinated and interested with UK artists. Yeah. Cause, well, because of the grime and drill and maybe in the yeah. more modern day rap stuff. I get you. I know what you mean though. And, and, mm-hmm. and I can't help but feel the way I did when I was super young is it's not that I didn't, it's not that I didn't get the English accent, but sometimes mm-hmm. it just felt like, yo, like 
it's just uh, yeah uh, cringe is the only way it's not even cringe it's hard to explain but it just it it was just so raw and fresh and new it was, and, and it's real interesting because you go back and you listen to that that stuff now it's iconic like, yeah it, 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 it's really stood the test of time it really has yeah. you know and and people actually knew like who they were and they had a, an, an individual perspective and identity early on it's just Big that time. Everyone else wasn't ready for it yet, you know. Yeah, you know, and also I think the generational thing, um, mm. uh, you know, uh, with uh, with each generation, um, adapting it and molding it to the cultural events of the day and and things like, um, I don't know, just um, what's it called? Um, just making it making it transferable to a to mm. a wider audience. I forget the word, yeah. but, but it'll come to me. Yeah, um, graphs like that as well, and. This was something I kind of wanted to bring up with you, um, because I think I think all of us feel like Graph is like the last bastion of of public um, public voice. You know what I mean? No one's going to shut off a graffiti writer for, for a protest piece, mm-hmm. or um, you know, or the internalized the socialness of like this scene and how. Uh, even if we're the only ones that can read it, that's all that matters to us kind of sensibility. Mm-hmm. Um, that that now has, it's moved considerably, mm. hasn't it? So mm-hmm. in a very similar vein as UK hip hop and, um, mm-hmm. and German rap, it's like, mm. it's, it's almost like modernized into a particular way that makes it, um, uh, what's the word? It makes it... Um, I don't know, commercial makes it tolerated. Do you know I think what I, mean? I think it's I feel like it's been through its waves too though. Like I feel like this is something that graffiti does every decade or something because when you talk with Futura, you know, about like when everything exploded in the eighties for them and for his group of guys and they were getting to travel to Europe and brands were suddenly, you know, co opting what they did and putting it on their products and they were in galleries and everything and then as soon as it sort of took off, it kind of died. And then the nineties, I remember kind of a distinct era where, you know, a lot of brands were co-opting graffiti and their marketing, like kind mm. of badly most of the time, you know, and, um, and, you know, it, it, people were taking the visual aesthetic and kind of trying to run with it and market things to kids. And sort of eventually it sort of, it, 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 you know, people tire of it again. And it mm. kind of goes back into its kind of underground phase again. And then, you know, it comes back. I mean, maybe things have been a bit different in the last decade because of the kind of whole advent of the large mural kind of festival and the kind of that transition that a lot of people from our scene made from people that were exclusively painting subways that then became some of the most prolific mural artists and were being referred to as you know, street artists, which mm. always when you talk about cringe for writers, that's always a hard one to swallow. Like when someone calls you a street artist, you know, Um, but but it is really different now, you know, because it's like, it has morphed in some ways. And, you know, we've just come through a period of time where the most large scale murals have been painted globally, like um, more than any other time in human history. Yeah. You know, and and albeit that it was tied to a lot of weird commercial stuff, you know, a lot of gentrification, like there were definitely a lot of us being used as the kind of soft arm of gentrification, you know, um, you know, and artists are artists, you know, artists um, kind of more often than not are creating from a pure place. Mm-hmm. It's usually all of those other interests that kind of attach themselves to you that, are yeah. sort of, you know, kind of a bit more questionable and parasitic you know yeah and, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah yeah so with that in mind um ask you with the with the event of of these breakthroughs and um just like you say technology playing its part and mm. even yeah like you say gentrification um even in the last two years three years in and out of covid where lockdowns were rife a lot of writers they went out and they actually <laughs> took full advantage of the masks full advantage of the silent roads and just yeah. went hammering tongs and it, i mean this also played a huge role in where we are with graph at the moment right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah i mean i mean my life changed considerably 
during the the kind of whole you know that that main two years first two years of this kind of whole scenario with COVID because you know it, it we I went from living in New York to then getting stuck in New Zealand with the border closure uh, then I flew out for 10 days for a mural job wow. to make some money left my wife in New York and as we say back home next minute they closed the border and I was stuck there and we went into a really you know really strict lockdown well the advantage of that was you know, New Zealand, <clears throat> you know, for a good two years kind of dodged dodged the bullet, you know, because the casualties were incredibly low, you mm-hmm. know, for, you know, were below 20 for like 20 deaths for like the longest time. And they were doing stretches of like, you know, 110, 130 days without a single community transmission. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, the, the flip side of that was that, you know, they, they had some really long lockdowns, you know, um, mm-hmm. and I was in the first one. Creatively speaking, it was probably one of the best things that ever happened to me, mm-hmm. just as far as like having to sit in one place long enough to reflect and to mm-hmm. have a whole bunch of things that I have generally taken for granted that I can do, which is travel, you know, like anywhere and just paint, you know, like kind of, just kind of taken away and I had to really reflect and and I went into a really different phase of making work which has has really stuck with me and I think that it's given me a sort of clarity that I'm actually really appreciative of um but it wasn't necessarily easy on everyone so so what was the what was the what was the turning point creatively for you 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 mentioned there that there's a system I guess that a creative system that you've got in place so what is what is that system that you've been working with well I mean I kind of came back full circle because I kind of came back to the 3D aspect of what appealed to me when I was young mm-hmm. and like, and I, and I started working a lot more digitally to kind of plot out and plan my work, be it my graffiti paintings, you know, my studio paintings, my mural paintings, but also delve really deep into, into animation and all sorts of things that I had wanted to spend more time learning. Wow. You know, but always felt really flat out and rushed rushed off my feet to really get, have the clarity and, and, and peace and time to to do it. So mm-hmm. it, it kind of just really, it was really nice. Like I just actually, I really kind of went into a different headspace with that and, and, and gave it time and learned a lot, you know, started playing a lot. Uh, I've always wanted to work more, much more with augmented reality. I yeah. think for me, I think people are kind of missing the point a little bit with AR and stuff. Like people sort of are seeing it as an escape from the world. And I see augmented reality as that as a way to enhance the actual world around us. And from a historical and, and um, you know, educational viewpoint, the ability to um, put accessible information and attach it to, to physical landmarks so people can learn context and history of spaces yeah, or wicked. you know is, is really cool like you know and especially as we all walk around with pretty powerful little computers in our pockets mm. you know and and now of course you know the uh um you know the speed of the internet is is getting such that we're able to like download all sorts of really really high bandwidth content which we've never been able to do you know and so all of that kind of excited me because you know to me it's like there's potential to kind of like hijack that, you know, and share all sorts of information to show, say, for example, when people go to a wall, now they could potentially be able to see, you know, scan a QR code or or activate something, an animation from just holding up their phone and the image can actually like trigger it and they can see processed video they could hear audio of like the artist speaking about their experience. You could learn the history of that site. Like you could peel back all the layers off the wall and every wall that was ever painted wow. there. Like we could be thinking so differently about this and how it impacts graffiti. So yeah, I, I just I see all the potential there. I don't I don't see it as escapism. I see it as something to kind of really refocus our appreciation of the world around us. You know? mm. And gra- what is graffiti? Graffiti is nothing without pretty much context of the environment and the surrounds in which it belongs, you know, but it's temporal. So it's like, you know, and, and um, there's so many people out preserving that, you know, and that should be really readily accessible, you know, to everybody. Context. You said 
context within its environment. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. It was funny. It correlated with a conversation I had earlier on today and how certain areas of a city lean heavily on graph and it's Mm. tolerated so much, but then there's other areas where it really isn't. But then there's these other areas that one, one, um, one city that does spring to mind is LA Mm -hmm. because the way that that operates, I, I feel like there's, there's a lot of, places assigned i mean i I remember you know seeing i mean big up uti seeing these massive like production pieces do you know what i mean Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. and then and then you know you wouldn't see anything for ages you know what i mean like these are these Uh are assigned it's almost like and i i do respectfully that there are some cities in the states that are like that that um they're almost like designated areas for graph but but Mm. being designated means that it's just a higher value Mm. I think like LA is really a complicated city too because LA has a really deep and entrenched gang culture yeah. and the gang the gang graffiti like it's really easy as an outsider to just skim over it and to not value or understand or be able to read what that is mm. but there's people who use that as a navigation system for understanding like where they can go where they can't go Mm. who's here who's there like a lot of that sort of stuff and regular people don't really understand it and even us graffiti writers that come from more of a style perspective of like thinking more about like painting stylistic kind of artwork you know um we also think kind of about going everywhere and that we're kind of free and we're not limited by the kind of confines of, Mm. of these types of rules but this is where graffiti writers can get into a lot a lot of trouble like yeah. by going over over gang stuff and not understanding what it is and 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 that so la for me was always like fortunately like i had a really uh eye-opening experience more or less my very first time in uh, los angeles you know we had a run-in in highland park with um, these guys from this gang the avenues like and i had only been in la for about 12 hours and i had flown in and gone with my friends to a party with revoke and everyone and they were hanging out with all these like kind of LA kind of like, you know, celebrities. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I feel like we were at the, a birthday party of some chick off that that show, The Hills. It was like a reality show at the time. And it was all this. Yeah. And I was like, oh, wow, these guys really live this LA life. And then the next day we're having a run-in with gangsters, you know, and they've got guns. And it's like, it's almost a real serious situation. And they know how to God. navigate. These guys know how to navigate both worlds. You know, they just are breezing through this whole thing like that they're, they're about it you know and it was like damn it's super eye-opening because i wouldn't know any of this shit you know how do they navigate that though how did i mean revoke and the, i mean these guys are tons these are legends mm-hmm. do you know what i mean like mm-hmm. so it goes without saying that hell yeah they know how to do that like you know these you know their capes are on you know are inside with the, with the cans under the fucking belt man like this is mm-hmm. how really but yo like that's no mean feat and if you've only been there for like Less than a day. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a bit real, isn't it? It was it was pretty surreal for me and my friends because, you know, like, uh, to me, I didn't um, recognize the seriousness of the situation. And so, like, even some of the gangster kind of guys were so almost kind of cartoonish to me because mm. they were so everything that you see, like all the stereotypes that people are kind of portrayed to be in the kind of media, popular media that we have grown up watching movies and TV shows and stuff like that, and music. Mm. They, they were that. They were using these terminologies and they were dressing a particular way and they had particular tattoos. And, you know, and I was a little excited and kind of like, kind of giggly, like a little giddy with the whole thing, which was a bit weird, but I just was so wow. fresh, you know, that I didn't mm. really understand the seriousness. And then my other friends like steps on my foot like bro like that guy's got a gun like do realize that we're kind of in trouble right now yeah yeah so you know it was interesting you know it's just one of the many experiences i had there and i don't really know other than just being of that place and navigating that place and growing up there and just knowing the way it works you know and being Mm -hmm. through so much how my friends um survive in that world um but i guess the short answer is not easily you know, mm. because like they've all had so much strife and conflict in their lives and um, they've had to really fight their way through it. And they are really tough people, 
you know, like they really are, you know. Mm. Yeah, you know, big up them, man. Big, big them up all yeah. day. Rick, yeah, revokes one of those guys too who who can just move through many different worlds, mm. you know. Like you know, because also watching him navigate the the fine art world and the gallery world and his kind of openness and excitement for that and his ability to network and reach out and just talk to people. Like when he was really setting his sights on moving his creatively in that direction, like he, he was just so interested. He was, he had enthusiasm and excitement that was infectious. And mm. I'd go there and, and instead of going out to, you know, to paint or whatever, then suddenly he was taking me to like a hundred amazing galleries, you know, and he'd so walk good. in with all the all the kind of eagerness and confidence in the world of just be able to break the ice and have a conversation with like he'd find the artist or he'd find the curator and talk to them. And I'd just, you know, mm. I, I still had that kind of sheepish kind of thing where I felt like that world wasn't for us. So I would be like all like quiet when I go into those spaces and not say anything, like enjoy it and love mm-hmm. the art, but never never just break the ice like the way he would, you know. Yeah, it takes it. it, It's a a character that can morph from one environment to another. That's that's a that's a that's a that's a life skill, isn't it? It's 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 just having the the confidence, you know, Mm. having the confidence and 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 you know, I think the excitement, the enthusiasm, you know, like I think that's the thing that kind of um, sets certain people apart in our scene that um, have longevity. Like I think of mean has that kind of excitement. I think of um, Wayne from New York is another yeah. guy that's just, just maintained this kind of um, enthusiasm. Curiosity, a vibe. Curiosity. Yeah. It is curiosity. It's And it comes back once again to this notion of play. It circles back again, you know, never losing that ability to play, you know. Um, mm. It's so it's so special. It's, it's not just the, um, it's not just the, the key you know, to this kind of youthfulness that they have, but it's also the key to kind of an openness and, and an ability to evolve and progress, which is like oh, really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big up Wayne as well. You want oh, fucking the legend. man. Yeah. <laughs> the man. And, and just a, a, a vessel of ideas and creative yeah. feedback. Yeah, you know, but also walks that really amazing line between kind of, the youthful, playful, enthusiasm, excitement about what other people are doing and strong tradition. Big time. And he and he hasn't had to deviate that far from that, which is real cool. You know, he's he's just maintained that, which I think is great. For um for crews like MSK, because mm. you said tradition there, and I, that's something that by in a very jazz kind of way, that tradition gets passed down. And mm-hmm. it, it rarely gets passed down outside of the circle. Like you got to know someone who knows someone and, and they got to like you first. They got to trust that you go the distance. And, and, and that, that just comes from your own tenacity and wanting to be in that world. Um, with, with that being the main driver of style within graffiti, do you feel like that, can sometimes be under threat mm. with the with the new wave of street art and the way that 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 just takes a can and runs with it. Oh, I think it's 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 really different now. Like I feel like it's it's almost gone. Yeah. That generation, that that lineage, and that kind of generational thing, and that kind of schooling from elders to younger younger artists and stuff. I I, I don't really see it. Like everybody's just kind of their own little entity and, and they have this kind of, um, you know, they have the World Wide Web, this kind of resource to kind of scour everything and kind of work out what they want to do and they like and they kind of take the bits they want, you know. Um, they don't how do, so, how do you feel about that? How do you feel about that? I mean, I relate to it on some level because, like, I didn't, I didn't have elders in my city per se that were really taking the time to teach me. Mm-hmm. That's why I sought out elders from abroad yeah. and brought brought them to New Zealand to kind of to feel that. Had I, you know, not done that, I probably would have probably done the same thing that a lot of younger writers are doing today. Mm-hmm. But you know, I did love going to the United States and meeting these crews where you know they're crews that have been around since some seventies, eighties. You know, MSK started in I, I think it's of eighty eight. 
um, AWR, I think, in eighty seven. You know, so they they mm. they had their little lineage there, and there's a a lot of people in these crews. Like people don't even realize how big MSK is. It's like, and and it spans it spans like generations. Like there's cats that are you know, there's there's kind of this late eighties nineties era of guys, and there's a few people that kind of trickled out of that era. And kind of stayed stayed active, but there's a ton of people who have gone in different directions in their life, like every crew. Mm-hmm. But when I go through the list of like how many members, I mean, it's a lot. Like I, I, I honestly think there could be over a hundred people. Well, in MSK, wow! Like uh, over for all time of that crew existing, yeah, definitely, okay. definitely. You know, like, but there's people whose names you're definitely going to know more, you know, because yeah. you're going to know a saber. You know, because Saber, Saber just did so much, and he he he's been there since more or less the beginning, and he's he's still present. You know what I mean? And yeah. you, you're going to know a GK because of just like what he did in LA of changing the whole kind of approach. Yeah, you know, for sure, re- decent stuff up high that people couldn't buff. You know what I mean? You yeah. you're going to know as a Zess because a Zess is like, you know, Zess is somebody who. Um, He's just so unique and he's so part of that landscape. Like he still has tags from the early nineties that have never been painted out because they, they have to like rent a crane. <laughs> to, to, to play paint it out, Try you know? getting that pal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, be my guest. You know, and, and you're going to, you're going to know what these characters, you know, like, mm. you know, the ones that have sort of transcended, but behind that there's all the low key characters as well that, were all part of it and there were people they all played their part you know and, and only like you know the third to last person or fourth to last person actually put in that crew you know like it's really slowed down a lot in the last few years and i don't think it's really building like that the way it was you know but um uh you know the history's wild like it's, wild. it's like if they ever did a documentary series by msk it would have to be a tv series it couldn't be a movie it'd be just crazy there's too much history there yeah yeah there really is there really is and uh, you know i'm now thinking back and all the documentaries and you know and then and and even this podcast gets put into Mm. these you know the the bigger organism of msk and it's um it's it's, it's a force isn't it it's a fucking force i mean and you have your uk writers as well because you have like innovators like roy you know who's probably I mean, for me, I would put him in my top, like, five most innovative people yeah. in graffiti today. Easy. Bad man. Easy he bad could, man. Be, could, could be number one for me, mm. you know, just as far as, like, someone that has their, their own lane mm. and just just keeps pushing forward and kind of indulging that, that journey. And it's really, it's it really, really sing, yeah, singular. It's not, he's not. I don't see any outside influence from graffiti writers, at least. I, I see mm. the influences from the kind of design that he likes and the illustration that he appreciates and, and things like that, and the music that he likes. But I don't see like him ever look like any other graffiti writer, but I see a ton of graffiti writers look like him, you know? <laughs> mm, yeah, right. Yeah. Um, tell me, tell me <laughs> a crazy MSK story. With you involved in it, what would be a crazy story? Oh man, there's quite a few, eh? Because it's like you got all the time in the world. Yeah, <laughs> you can do as many as you let, want. Let me think about maybe, maybe probably like a really interesting story is about when I did the road trip with Revoke Zess Auger right across the United States, and we drove from Los Angeles to Detroit. Um, over the course of roughly a week, that's no joke. And yeah, it was it was amazing. But I I had just got out of hospital, like I just recovered from like I had this thing was like I had all the symptoms of a stroke. I was paralyzed down one side of my body and just temporarily. And and wow. um, and although I was like mostly better, it was about more or less a two year kind of recovery for me. So wow. I wasn't at I wasn't at my full capacity you know i was you know trying to keep up with some of the most intense graffiti writers in history and <laughs> kind of feeling like i might die if i, <laughs> if I paint every single night you know all the times <laughs> we had this amazing thing happen it was crazy it's actually really funny we went to um 
Chicago and we picked up next who was, you know, rest in peace, who was living out there. At rest the time. in peace, very much so. And he, he rented a car, like a pretty nice car, and told me, you know, because he wanted me to ride in. We didn't know each other too well yet. And he was like, I want you to ride in the car with me so we can get to know each other a bit better. So I jumped in his car. We did the drive to, to Detroit. And he told me, you know, I, I'm pretty infamous with rental cars. You know, like I've learned to pretty much always get the full insurance because I'm like always fucking up these cars. I was like, all right, you know, which is something I didn't even like even appreciate until later <laughs> so we get into detroit and revokes already got his apartment out there he's been living there and everything and he's he's been a good host and we're having a good time he's like we're going straight out and painting spots we did like pieces as soon as we arrived and painted until like sunrise Sick. and then um try to do the freeway spot and got chased off so you know it was like the freeway off ramp we're trying to do this uh, this chrome msk we got chased off and then I know I think it was the next night and I was just like I was like oh no this, that's right it wasn't quite the next night it was the next night and we went out and we were doing spot after spot we went to the gas station and um me and Zest like had just an awkward encounter with a local guy in the gas station he was just like staring us out and just mm-hmm. being real intense and then we went back and hopped in the car and I noticed that the guy was like on the forecourt just idling waiting for us to pull out and then we pulled out and he pulled out right behind us. Then we turned left and he turned left and we turned right and he turned right. And then just suddenly the entire back windscreen of the car shattered. Revoke starts driving defensively. He's like swerving and he's like, is he shooting? Is he shooting at us? And like, we're all down me, Zeps and Olga in the back seat, and we're like completely covered in shattered glass. And we're swerving all over the road like maniacs. And I'm like trying to look back through like the back windows kind of to see if this guy is shooting at us or chasing us. And uh, he just very casually drives into, I guess, his driveway. What? And I'm, like, and I'm like, hang on, this doesn't make sense. So we like pull up and we're kind of taking stock of the whole thing. And um, Revoke's like, did he shoot us? And then Orgo's feeling around and goes, no, nah, there's this hip flask. And it was like a hip flask of, of like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like sitting there and he's like, I think he threw a bottle through the through the back windscreen. Wow. And everybody's everybody's like, what the fuck? And we're talking about it. And I keep hearing hearing uh next. He's sitting in the front seat and he's just quietly saying, Everyone, it's mine. And everyone just keeps talking, like, wow, did he shoot it? Like, you know, blah, 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 like buzzing out. The adrenaline's going, and he's like, finally, like, it's mine. It's mine. I finished the hip flask. It was like a hip flask of Hennessy. He said, and I just threw it in the air <laughs> as we were driving. And I guess it came down and came through the back windscreen and smashed oh the Oh, my the God. So the story doesn't quite end there. So he, he goes and returns to the rental car. And they're like to him, uh, they're like looking at him. And he's like, yeah, I don't know what happened. Someone smashed into the car. We just left it parked on the street. And um, and then, yeah, basically um, gets a new rental car because it's got the full insurance. And the next night, they want to go and finish the piece that we started on the first night that we got chased off. And right. I said, I'm done. Like, I'm super tired. Like, I feel like my face is going to fall off. Like, I'm mm-hmm. just so exhausted. So I'm going to stay back. They're like, fair enough. So they all go out. They come back in like some ungodly hour. They're all wet. All of them, it's pissing down in the rain. They're all drenched. They've all been running like on foot like, through the streets of like Detroit. And I'm like, what happened? And I'm like, it's so crazy. They're like, we were doing the, the spot. We had parked the car around the corner and cops came and we all ran off or whatever. And then next is like, I was hiding in these bushes and it's pissing down with rain. And I'm looking and the cops pull up right at our rental car. And they broke in and stole the car. Uniformed police officers stole the car, uh, the rental car. Oh my and, um, God. Yeah. So he's like, fuck it, I've got to go to the precinct and basically um, report the car stolen and see if, it, if it's turned up. Oh and he went God. to the precinct and they told him, um, we don't deal with car theft anymore in Detroit. We don't deal with anything that's less than felony or murder. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so then he had to Detroit. he had to he had to call and ask for um another car for a second like it would be now his third car 
so he could drive home to Chicago. Oh my God. <laughs> and he, he drove home to Chicago. And I feel like there's an extra little part of the story because the next time I came to Detroit, which was the last trip where I hung out with him before he passed away, and he had moved to Detroit. He had a rental car that weekend too. And we're doing this festival thing that Revolt organized. Mm -hmm. And um, he was using the rental car as a ladder to finish this piece. And he was just walking all over the roof and just showering this car with spray paint. Like, oh my just, God. And he's like, can you get up on the roof and like, you know, can you do these flames in my background? Like that kind of flamey effect you do. Yeah, and I'm yeah. like, yeah, sure, yeah, sure. And I'm looking at this car. I'm like, he's totally fucked up another car. Like, totally. Like, this guy must be, like, honestly, I'm, I'm surprised he wasn't on some like national database. Like, do not, <laughs> do not rent your car to this guy. But I admire characters like that. You know, just walk it how they talk it and just don't worry about shit. A hundred percent. That was him. That was him in a nutshell, you know. Pretty wild dude, you know. But, uh, yeah, I, I I, just, I love thinking about it, that whole scenario. I mean, that's gold, man. You you can't make that shit. That, that shit doesn't. That doesn't show up in New Zealand readily, let alone the rest of the world. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, there's different type of characters, man. Like, you know, definitely people like who, as you say, like they live it. You know, this guy just traveled around the entire United States just racking and painting, you know, and just living that life, that life 100%, you know. Yeah. So, you know, and, and, and there's a lot of characters like that in our crew, you know. They sort of remind me like Australian writers are like that. And there was a big connection between Next and Dizzy, his brother, and um, and the DTS guys from Australia. Oh, from Brisbane. really? Okay. Yeah, because um, Seiko, you know, who who um, is a Brisbane writer, right. uh, had lived for lived with his brother for a time in Houston. And um, and then I think that they had a massive impact on on those younger um, younger guys out there in the scene, like Dizzy and Next, who then went mm -hmm. on to like become like huge, you know. So, yeah, you, man. yeah. Australia don't fuck about. I've seen no, they don't. fucking amazing fucking writers out there. So sick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Aussie writers are kind of wired a little bit different. Um, I, I feel like you know the train writers in cities like Sydney are kind of a bit like the writers in Madrid. You know, like mm -hmm. just the way that they run at it, and they're just. They do crazy shit and they make it work, you know. And it's just mm. and they have a real, a real casual attitude about it, which is always wild, you know. What I wanted to kind of chat to you about before uh, you leaving is is more your own style, yourself, mm. and mm -hmm. and just like I mean the, the techers, the techers in it is just mm. you know jaw dropping. How often, how often do you sketch? How often do you um, paint? How how frequent, how, how often are you devising new styles and techniques? Like, I kind of want to know more about your day-to-day -day approach because that seems to be mm -hmm. the only way I think I'm going to get the most uh, uh, upfront answer. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Well, I guess, like, for me, um, the, big, the big leap for me and my friends was in 2008, 2009, um, where we kind of really tried to push the, the limits of – graffiti like because we felt like very constrained like that it was very formulaic like that you know you would kind of paint more or less the same formula every time you do a sketch you do a fade three color fade put an outline of 3d mm -hmm. going in one direction some bubbles an aura some highlights you just put up your crew name and shout out your mates repeat mm -hmm. repeat 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 mm -hmm. and we started thinking about like what if we start reordering the way we apply it what if we start um, painting with the kind of um, the flare of, and I say flare because we did do a lot of flares and a lot of technical stuff with fat caps, but started thinking like the spray, the spray can is a painting tool rather than a graphic design tool because a lot of people back then were really concerned with doing kind of really crisp vector looking stuff that mm. I feel like the sort of the influence of kind of like vector graphics was really strong. Mm -hmm. and, and um, so, yeah, we, we just loosened up and we started doing this kind of net stuff. But we also started letting go of um, some of our real own rigid kind of approaches, creative approaches and, and our own hand. So we did that by um, painting on each other's pieces. So if someone like Burst, who's my main partner in crime, you know, 
mm. through that era, if him and I uh, were painting a piece, we would paint 50% of each other's pieces. So you we, we could change. Oh, that's so sick. If there were 10 people on the wall, then we would all just switch around and work all over everybody's stuff to kind of like, and, and what it did was it, it we, we had an agreement that anything that anyone else did to your piece, then you could then absorb that into your language, you know, and, and wow. build on it. And, and what it did was it, we had a real exponential creative growth, you know, like things just kind of took off really fast, like, and it started influencing other people. And that's never really happened for, for us in New Zealand where uh, something that was coming out of New Zealand, typically we were always copying everyone else. Cause we're like, mm. we do that with everything. Cause we're like this far remote country, you know? So you've always got, you know, in the sixties, you always had, you know, New Zealand's answer to the Beatles or New Zealand's answer yeah. to Elvis, you know, or New Zealand's answer, you know, later it's like, you know, people trying to sing like Bob Marley, you know, like everyone was always copying stuff and, in a pre-internet era, you know, mm. you could probably get away with that, but not anymore. And we mm. never had influence emanating outwards. So to reach a point where my New Zealand crew, TMD, you know, like where we started kind of like people were name checking us and rev referencing us and building on ideas that we were doing was like, yeah, it was a short moment, but it was like really powerful for us because we were bet. like, oh, it, it can be done, you know. Yeah. Um, as far as my day-to-day -day process now, man, like to be honest, like – I I kind of just took like almost the whole year off everything mm. I've, um, and you know, that corresponds directly with the birth of my daughter. So mm. um, I've, I've been, you know, I decided to, um, to, to stop working in those early months just to be like a hundred percent present and to support my wife um, mm -hmm. fully. Um, so we both did that. I worked super hard prior to have enough money to do it. And then that's kind of dragged on because she's gone. <laughs> she's gone back to work, and she was studying full time, and then went back to work. and And now my days are mostly concerned with hanging with my daughter, you know, and being a dad. And I get a little bit of time to kind of create. I can break away and do a piece once in a while. Um, but my attitude is that anything that I do now, you know, I try to make it really worth something. Really, mm. I, I try to make the very most of every opportunity. You know, I try not to squander it. And so I put mm. my my heart and soul into what I do. I, I try to be 110% everything. It's like, you know, even if it takes me weeks to paint something, if I have mm. to go back to the wall and paint over consecutive weekends to get it done, I'm going to do it and I'm going to, like, paint. I'll paint, you know, whereas, my, you know, we used to be about numbers. We'd go do three, four pieces in a night or something. It's mm. like, I just can't, I can't be like that now. I just, like... If I can only walk, if I only walk away this year with two or three pieces, you know, in, in my photo album, you know, yeah. um, I want I want them to be real good, you know, and I want them to, you know, so yeah, this whole kind of circling back and feeding all this kind of digital technology and this three D influence, but bringing letters back into my fine art, um, but finding new ways to look at lettering. Mm. You know, because I've been creating animation, animated sequences and then taking stills from the animated sequences where mm. all the letters are rotating and moving and the camera's moving around it yeah. and it's assembling and all these weird intersections and everything. You can create these kind of abstract compositions based on that. Uh, and you can look at letters from different perspectives. You can look at letters from the inside, from behind, from below, and you can use them as the basis for, for paintings and it it's, translates really well. It's crazy, isn't it? That, you know you just could never write it it's, no. and the fact that you are taking your time yeah mm -hmm. the fact that you're taking your time and being sparing and making every piece count i think there's a lot to be taken away from that yeah i mean because i like i definitely have adhd so it's quite a struggle for me to do that but i mm -hmm. feel like the discipline the discipline is is necessary you know now because it's like yeah, and and I'm fortunate, man. Like just with my working situation and everything, like mm. that. Basically, like when people approach me t with an opportunity to work and make money, they want me for me. They don't want me to like, you know. I used to run a commercial art business when I was young, alongside doing that festival, and I had to do a lot of soul destroying work. Or you'd come, they'd give you a brief, and the brief was like examples of ten other people. You know, whereas now people come to me with like a brief that's based on my own kind of like a body of work 
and kind of like this is the stuff that we like and we love this direction create something for us you know and it's like oh you know yeah like which is a real nice place to be you know i might only yeah. get a half a dozen jobs in a year you know but those jobs are you know like they're usually meaningful and they're usually something that i'm happy to show mm. uh as opposed to prior i used to do a lot of work that was like you would never see it was just about, just about paying the bills. That doesn't come out on the social media. <laughs> no, no, no. When you, when you start seeing, because they start, you know, writing contracts for you, like some of these, if you work through an agency, like I do from time to time uh, here in the US, you get these contracts presented to you and they want you to post X amount of times on your social media and stuff like that. And it's like, yeah, that's, that's fine. But, you know, I, I, I don't know how meaningful that really is as far as marketing goes. I think the gig's kind of up on the influencer shit. I think like people kind of mm. know how to smell it, you know, and yeah. you know, the whole kind of subver- subversion of that social media space is kind of, I think, I think that's a, a model that the Kardashians really, they probably didn't pioneer, but finessed and did well. Most definitely and, um, finessed. Yeah, and I don't, I don't know if that's like. I mean, I don't know if, I don't know if I'm influential <laughs> enough to like convince somebody to buy something, you know, with my Instagram, you know. So it's I don't like, know about I, that, man. I mean, you do good on the socials, brother. I think like with social media, like for me personally, like I, I just, I like to keep it really. um I think this word gets used a lot, authentic. Um, mm. And I think people use authenticity in some pretty inauthentic ways. But I, I like, uh, you know, I'm pretty much an open book. Like I just kind of, I just tell stories and share things. And I and I, I literally just share them because it might be enjoyable mm. for somebody, you know, and someone might like it. And it really doesn't matter, uh, you know, what the engagement is and what the metrics of it look like. I, don't, I really don't care, you know. Mm. <laughs> it's like... Uh, you know, it's, if, it, if it's just something that's, I've got a pretty naive and nice attitude about sharing on social media, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I think we need a little more of that. We're going to get back to that. Dude, just hang on in there. Keep putting this stuff out, man. We love watching it. We love reading it. Um, Portland most definitely has. It's a, it's a jewel in the rough right here. Um, with the mighty <laughs> MSK. Brother, Thank you so much for joining us, man. Thank you for being a part of the uh, the podcast catalog. No, it's, it's it's a real pleasure, man. Thanks for reaching out and inviting me. It was, it was a, a really nice chat that we just had, man. I really appreciate it. Oh, man, me too. Enough people told people that you were coming on. They're like, no, why are you coming on? Yeah, so, yeah you're that guy. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, oh, that's, that's awesome, man. <laughs> it's like, I always find it surprising, but it's cool. Yeah, man, you're in a good place. Keep up the great work. And uh, yeah, we'll be studies watching on. Awesome, man. Take care, man. Ladies and gentlemen, Killer Killer Podcast. Out like it was our fashion. You know what it do. Sharing is caring, all right? Do you remember, crime don't pay, but neither do they, all right? Don't talk to anyone I wouldn't. Big love, my brother. You stay lucky, people. Peace. (laughs) 